Good morning. morning. Welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to this very special day as we celebrate homecoming. We are excited always. Every Sunday is a a time to remember God's goodness and faithfulness to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. But homecoming is a particular time where we get to celebrate remembering His faithfulness to uh, this particular church over the years. And so we are grateful for Uh, The uh, rich heritage that this church has of loving people in Christ, of seeing folks uh, come to know Jesus, uh, faithful preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Um, And so we are uh, glad to be here this day. We're excited you're here with us. And so we are um, looking now to our bulletin on the back, if you would, uh, at a few announcements. one uh, that is in the newsletter that I'll highlight in a second, uh, but not here in the announcements. We will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper uh, next Sunday. So we always seek to give you uh, not warning, but just time to uh, examine your heart, time to prepare, uh, using even the service this morning to get ready as we come to the Lord's table. Uh, it is a wonderful time to come to the table uh, to be renewed and refreshed. We meet Christ uh, spiritually there and uh, our faith is grown and encouraged. And so it is a time of remembrance, and so we encourage you this week to uh, prepare your hearts for that. Um, Again, it is uh, homecoming today, and uh, we do welcome uh, Wallace and Ruth Tinsley. Uh, Wallace will open the Word of God for us this morning. Uh, He is, I'm sure, known to to most, if not all of you. Uh, He is a a longtime servant of the Lord, uh, preaching faithfully, at uh, Filbert Presbyterian Church just down the road and uh, uh, has recently retired and is enjoying time now for a variety of other things. I'll let him share some of those, Uh, but uh, he is uh, a a friend and supporter of this church, uh, and I count it a privilege to call him uh, both you, uh, Ruth, and Wallace as friends. So thank you for being here this morning. by way of, uh, of homecoming, afterwards, if you would like to stay, we have a, a catered lunch uh, that is provided, so please stay. It's just another way for us to enjoy being together and the Lord's uh, faithfulness. Um, normally, we have a, a once-a-month uh, ladies' um, luncheon, and uh, we will not be doing that this month because um, during the summertime, uh, we're doing our, our ladies' summer Bible study Wednesday in the Word, and so uh, beginning this coming Wednesday uh, from 9.30 to 11, we'll have a series of, of six Bible studies. Uh, there is child care provided, so it can be a wonderful time, uh, ladies, uh, to, to bring uh, children. They'll be watched, cared for well, where you can come and enjoy some fellowship, some time in the Word. Um, and if you uh, want to engage, be involved in that, there's details in the uh, newsletter. You can talk to my wife as well. Um, First Timothy, right? It's the study, and so there is a book uh, with that. Um, this is our uh, monthly newsletter, the Temple Times, and so please grab one of these. Uh, it is also uh, on our church website. Will be emailed to you uh, many different forms, but it has a host of information of things that are coming up, uh, dates and details. Um, there is a, a calendar that you can either pull out, put in the refrigerator, or there's some extra copies in the lobby uh, for you to have those. Uh, there's birthdays that are in there. Um, and then uh, again, uh, we are having our Vacation Bible School coming up in July. And uh, so please mark the dates, July the 10th through the 14th. It's an evening uh, Bible school, and so hopefully uh, all can attend. So if you... Um, have children or grandchildren, uh, neighbors around you. We encourage you to invite them to this. It is a wonderful time to gather uh, for some age-appropriate, specific um, teaching of the Lord. Great fun. There's snacks, there's games, uh, there's a variety of things going on. So much more detail will be coming for that, but uh, there's a um, a flyer for that in uh, in the newsletter. Um, Again, uh, some other announcements things that are coming up, some great pictures uh, of some activities that have happened recently. And then again, uh, at the bottom of the last page, ladies, uh, there's some details about the the summer Bible study. So uh, I will not go through all of those details because it would take too long. Because of Christ, we gather. Because of Christ, this place exists. Uh, Because of Christ, uh, we come together as the body uh, to worship the Lord. 
And so we are called to worship this morning. We're called to not just be here uh, physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, to engage with the Lord, to ask that He would not just join us in our worship, but be the center of our worship, the heart of our worship, and receive it from us. So our call to worship this morning is from John chapter 4. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. That moment when she is confronted with Christ, God in her midst, and that she is to come to him in worship with all of her being, is the same God that calls you this morning. All of your being is to be laid before him. We are come this morning in the name of Jesus to worship through Jesus and in Jesus. And so let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this day. Uh, Again, an opportunity to remember, but primarily called this morning to remember not a place, not a people, not family or friends. It's part of this, but much more we're called to remember the greatest gift that you give, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. I pray that that would motivate us to not just worship outwardly, to not just sing or speak or think, but that you would stir in our hearts spiritual worship that we lay before you as our act of worship this morning. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Many people have been engaged over the years uh, to make Temple Presbyterian Church uh, a wonderful, warm, uh, Christ-centered place. Uh, But ultimately, all of that is through and because of our God in heaven. And so it is to Him that all glory, all praise is to be given. So let's stand this morning and sing number 56, To God Be the Glory.
Amen. Please be seated. I'll ask the uh, elders to come down front, if you would, and you can be on my left. And as they are coming, the Lales will come. And uh, Tucker, if you will come up as well, you can be on my right. We've had the uh, privilege of having uh, the Lales uh, come for membership, and Tucker Clinton as well. Um, have had some great opportunities to sit down with all of them at different points uh, to talk about uh, church membership, what it means. Um, again, uh, you have seen these folks here for a very long time, if you're a regular attender, um, and they have plugged in uh, for many, many months now, and they have been engaged and involved, and so it is already like they are a part of our family. Uh, spiritually, they definitely are, um, but they have determined that they uh, would like to become members of this particular church. Um, Ernie uh, Lale uh, works with, uh, at the Billy Graham Center in Charlotte, uh, and uh, Ernie and I have met a number of times and enjoyed getting to know each other. Um, Lindsay uh, works uh, one day a week as a dental hygienist, but uh, I said in, in our meeting earlier, her, her, greatest, uh, her greatest task is uh, to, uh, uh, to watch over Ernie uh, and their daughter, uh, Aubrey. Um, and uh, so it's been a joy uh, to meet with them at various times and get to know them. Um, Tucker is uh, a brain surgeon. No, just kidding. He's a, um, he's a student, uh, but love uh, Tucker and his family. And obviously they have plugged in and engaged with this church uh, for a good while now. We were commenting it was a year ago, uh, right around this time, that, uh, that they came as a family and joined. And so um, the session has met uh, with them, and so uh, Ernie and Lindsay um, and Tucker come by profession of faith as uh, full communing members. Aubrey is a non-communicant member, uh, and so uh, we love them and have enjoyed getting to know them. And uh, they are already members by uh, means of meeting with the session, and they have been welcomed in. And so I told them this is the easy part, uh, introduce you. Uh, but I do want to ask them the questions again that they've already affirmed uh, in our time together uh, as they've joined this church. And, and I ask as a reminder, yes to them, though they just answered these, uh, as a reminder to you, uh, if you are a member here, these are the same membership vows that you took. Uh, and if you're a member in a, another uh, um, Bible-believing church, you, you may have taken very similar vows. And these are serious vows before the Lord. Uh, this is not just a, uh, like a country club where you pay your dues and, and you're a member and you come and go and had a lot of responsibilities. As a, as a, as a member of Christ's church, uh, you're publicly professing Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Uh, they've done that. Uh, clear testimony. Um, and that they are engaged now and will continue to be engaged in, in involvement in this church. And we uh, have told them they have been a blessing to this church already. And uh, we pray that we are a blessing to them uh, moving forward. And so I'll ask again, uh, just for you to verbally affirm these, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving His displeasure, and without hope save for His sovereign mercy? Do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon Him alone for salvation as He is offered in the gospel? Do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you? Uh, do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? And lastly, do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace? And amen that they have affirmed these before and they do again. And so um, when we have time uh, during our um, uh, after the service at, at the lunch, I encourage you to uh, go to them and welcome them in. Uh, but now we, uh, we would like to extend the right hand of fellowship as we come across and welcome you as members to this church. Thank you. 
pastors have many privileges, uh, and that is certainly one of them, uh, to welcome uh, new folks into, uh, into the church. It is always a, a pleasure, and particularly on a day like this. Uh, it is continuing to see God's faithfulness uh, working in and through uh, the lives of the believers here, and so we are uh, grateful for this. Let's uh, look to the Lord again as we uh, go and lift a host of praises and requests to Him. Pray with me. Father, homecoming is always a, a special day, and we are thankful to be able to look back, remember the years of faithfulness that you have shown uh, to the people of this congregation to the families, those who are no longer with us, who have moved away, who are doing other things, other places, those who are now in your presence, Lord. Um, many uh, saints uh, who have been members here uh, have gone to be with you. Um, and Father, today as we uh, add to the number, uh, we are grateful uh, for these families that have joined us, these individuals. Uh, we're thankful that uh, they have uh, determined and chosen to be here with us. We pray your blessings on them. Lord, we ask that you'd continue to bless uh, Temple Presbyterian Church, uh, this, uh, uh, this unique and wonderful body of believers. We long to see uh, many come to know Jesus Christ. So I pray for the strength and stamina uh, of, of the folks that are here. I pray that we would go out. Uh, our first calling is not to make members of a particular church. Our first calling is not to simply uh, uh, see more people come to temple. Our first calling is to serve you and to tell others about the good news of Christ. So I pray, Father, you'd place that, press it upon our hearts, and that uh, you would be continuously faithful to add to uh, this church because uh, the people that are here are so overwhelmed in awe of and in love with you uh, that we can't not but tell others about Jesus as others hear about Jesus, that many would be uh, saved through Christ and that they would uh, even join us here, that they might grow and worship and learn and that we might then go back out and seek to do the same, that you'd multiply the ministry here. Thank you for the years of faithfulness of the pastors who have filled this pulpit. It is humbling uh, to look back on the heritage of, of rich biblical preaching and teaching. Uh, and we pray that on in the future, Lord, that this pulpit would always be a place that unapologetically, uh, biblically, exegetically uh, proclaims the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, Father, this world needs uh, what this church, what these people, what you have to offer. Uh, there is great discord and uh, there is not peace. And so Lord, we pray for this world. We pray for peace, uh, the, the ceasing of conflict, uh, the eradication of disease and, uh, and difficulty. But Lord, we know that uh, in this life we will have trouble. And so we pray, Father, that you would bring peace in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. First and foremost, peace between them and you through Christ. And so, Lord, we ask that you would uh, do this. We ask that you would hear our pleas and our prayers, even as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Often in life, uh, we have to do things sequentially. We have to do things in order. Uh, for something to happen, other things must have preceded those. Uh, even as we come to this time of bringing to the Lord tithes and offerings, something has preceded this. Christ, I pray, is your Lord and Savior that then motivates you towards loving and giving. And so Matthew tells us, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. You do not give to earn anything. You do not give to earn salvation or favor with God. We are to give in response to what has already happened, what first happened in us. And so now I pray that you will come with glad hearts as we give back to the Lord.
what a greater way to celebrate homecoming today than to be reminded of God's faithfulness to us throughout the years and His promised faithfulness into the future. So let's stand together and sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness, 139. Please be seated. Again, it is our uh, privilege and pleasure to have uh, Reverend Wallace Tinsley with us this morning. I've had a wonderful opportunity to get to know uh, he and Ruth the uh, last couple of years uh, as friends, but also um, as a fellow pastor, and to hear at Presbytery his wisdom, his calm uh, in sometimes the midst of a storm of uh, something that is going on. Uh, Wallace loves Christ. And he loves his church. And so we're honored to have you this morning coming up with the word. You want a Bible? It is a joy to be here. It is a joy to see all of you here. 
It's a joy to be in this building. It was a joy to be in the other building to begin with. Uh, it's a joy to be at this, at this place. We, Ruth and I are just overjoyed, really, to be here with you. Um, I remember Tom Clark's telling me that he used to read Psalm 78 to the congregation once a year. I assume that he read primarily verses 1 through 7, or if he was particularly adventurous, maybe verses 1 through 8. I also guess that his annual reading may have been at homecoming each year. I'm not sure about it. Those are guesses. Y'all can straighten me out afterwards um, about whether that's right or not. But nevertheless, I've chosen to preach from Psalm 78, especially verses 1 through 8, or specifically verses 1 through 8. And then in order to make the main point very clear, I've added two verses from the New Testament, Romans 6, 23, and Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. So if you're looking in the bulletin, you can strike the Leviticus passages, decided to concentrate on um, Romans and uh, Matthew and, and not... Um, not deal with those those passages today. So let's let's jump right into those three passages of Scripture. Psalm ninety eight, Psalm seventy eight, verses one through eight, and then Romans six twenty three. A very simple bad news and good news of the gospel. Sort of the whole thing wrapped up in one verse, and then Matthew twenty eight, the last two verses. So starting with Psalm seventy eight, this is God's word his inspired, his inerrant, infallible, holy word. Psalm 78, hear God's word. Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wondrous works that He has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel that they should teach them to their children that the generation to come might know them, might know even children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments, and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart, and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Eight verses from Psalm 78. Now, Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23. You may have learned a way of sharing the gospel that starts with two verses in Romans right away and maybe jumps to John 3.16 or something, but Romans 3.23 tells us we're all sinners. Romans 6.23 picks up where you leave off there if you're sharing that with somebody and tells you what you get with that sin, what you earn with that sin. Romans 6.23. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, so it's bad news and good news, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We won't spend much time on this, but if you watch carefully and rapidly, then you can confer together later on and, and put together a way to remember this. So Romans, Romans have a short sword, double-bladed sword. They pull out the Romans. Okay, look up here now. Mainly look at the Bible right now. Look up here. Romans, that's drawing a sword, Romans, that reminds you of this, Romans 6, 23. For, that's a pun, for 
for the wages of sin. For the wages, when you, when you work a week, then you get money like a bag of money being handed over to you. For the wages of sin is death, like Isaac deserved. He, that, he got the reprieve from the, by the angel, but Jesus got the, the death that we deserve. So, so Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6, 23. A simple, when, when you're passing this on to the next generation, the next generation, they be pretty little, and you can give them, in your own words, Romans 6, 23. Uh, so Psalm 78, and then Romans 6, 23, and then the end of Matthew, which gives us the command. It's sort of like the New Testament clear statement of, of Psalm 78, 1 through 7, or 1 through 8. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, all, teaching them to observe all, a 66 books worth, all that I commanded you. And I am with you, the Emmanuel principle, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we look at these passages, you have given us a promise that the Spirit uses the Word of God to change our hearts and thereby change our lives. And so we pray that that's what you would do, that we would worship you in spirit and truth. We continue to worship you in spirit and in truth and that you would convince us of the truths of this, these parts of Scripture and prepare us to serve and to send the gospel to future generations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the old North Church Tower as a signal light. One if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to get up and to arm. That was written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, a poet, in 1860, published in 1861. About 85 years after Paul Revere's famous ride, and I hope you know a lot about that part of history, that part of American history. How many people at the beginning of the war between the states could remember back to the beginning of the American Revolution from 1861 back to 1775? Not too many people, as the poem says. So here we are, June 4, 2023, almost exactly 50 years since the Sunday morning, the congregation of Beersheba Presbyterian Church voted to leave the denomination of the Presbyterian Church in the United States and authorized its session, quote, to join like-minded congregations in the organization of higher courts loyal to Scripture and to the Reformed faith. That action taken by Beersheba Congregation on July 1, 1973, was the same morning that the Filbert Church took its vote. So here's my brief summary of the message this morning, entitled, Hear the Gospel Heritage of Temple PCA Church. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of Jesus the Lord, 
who from heaven drew near to die and to rise in exchange for your souls. This good news of Jesus will never grow old. On the 4th of December in 73, a new church, Presbyterian and Reformed, came to be. They desired to continue to share the true gospel with all peoples and nations, receptive or hostile. Not many remember that day or that year. So I've come to make some things clear. The first is the gospel, Romans 6.23. Bad news, then good news. To help you to see that your heart can be changed by the Spirit's sharp sword. Repent of your sins and believe in the Lord. The second, to remind you of the founders of Temple, how they served in true faith and left you an example of the sacrifice that one day you may be called to give, taking a stand for the Bible so that others may live. On the 1st of July in 73, the congregation voted to be set free. Struggles and sufferings arose from that stand, but gospel light now shines from this rise in the land. To God be the glory, great things He has done. He established at temple the worship of His Son, May the Bible, the Reformed faith, and the good news of grace ever be lived and proclaimed in this holy place. So here's the outline. It's in the bullet. Listen, and then tell, and then live. Obey from your heart. And why? Two reasons. One is that that's what the Bible says. And two, you can be encouraged by those who have gone before you that led to the establishment of this place of sharing the gospel in a dark world. Psalm 78 is about intergenerational discipleship, passing on the good news of Jesus Christ from one generation to another generation and even to later generations. The people come and the people go, but the gospel remains exactly the same all the way down through the ages. You are a sinner. You need to be saved. Jesus is the only way of salvation. Repent of your sins. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then live the rest of your life in thanksgiving and praise for what He has done for you. If you look at the, the passage, I'm choosing three words. One's in verse 1. One's in verse, five, one's verse 6, and one's in verse 7. It's part of a process. There are more words in there that fit into the process, but I'm just, just picking so we have three points. So we'd, we'd start with the first verse, listen. ESV and the King James say, give ear. The NIV says, hear. Escucha pueblo mío something like that in Spanish, I don't know. But, I mean, I read it in Spanish, I just can't say it very well. Um, but, it, 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 and the give ear, that's, a, that's really good because when it, um, when it says, it starts out, listen, uh, that, that word has the, in Hebrew, has the ear word in it. So, when it, so it's give ear, it's use your ears. O oh, my people. Um, and then it says, listen, or, or hear, uh, hear the words of my mouth. So it, it uses my mouth twice. Uh, it uses listen twice. So it's a matter of my mouth to your ears. So listen. Of course, what you listen to is the word of God itself. Then in verse 6, you have tell. That's, that has the, the knowledge word in it. It's cause to know. King James says declare. The New Living Translation says to teach, and that's a good way to translate it. Uh, it is cause them to know. And then in verse 7, it says keep. Almost all the versions say keep. 
the New Living Translation says, obeying his commands. But it's, it's the word for a book, for a record book, for, for keeping close records, a scroll, and it's, it's sort of, it's sort of, think about a, a king, um, like in Esther, where, where King Ahasuerus uh, has a recorder, has a secretary who writes in a book or in a scroll, and that, that's the, the word there, right? And, and then when the king can't go to sleep one night, when he can't fall asleep, he gets his recorder to read it out. Well, that's, that's what you're to do with it. You listen, you speak, and you keep the Word of God in your heart. So it's, it's in there, in your heart, and in your soul. Both of those in verse 8. What the forefathers did not do, put it in their heart and prepare their heart and their soul. But you keep it in your heart and your soul so it's there to come out. So listen. It says we are to look at the Bible and to see parables and dark sayings. So my mouth to your ears, you listen, dark sayings of old, wisdom from above. I, I could share with you a parallel passage in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the great Old Testament Shema, the first word is Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you stand up, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and on the frontals of your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Friends of ours, a couple moved to Hilton Head and they bought a house in Hilton Head. We're not planning to buy a house in Hilton Head. But they, they, one, uh, the husband, it, they're cleaning out the house, they're repainting and doing stuff, and they, he said, yesterday, yesterday, I think, sent me a picture of something hanging on two doorposts in the house. He said, what is this? <laughs> and, and it... It, it had a Hebrew letter at the time. Well, he didn't know it was a Hebrew letter, but it had the first letter of the word Shema, which is the first letter of this passage in Deuteronomy 6, uh, which probably has Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 9, on a little scroll written up in it and stuck inside and put on the doorpost. It has the Shema, the, 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 the letter for S-H, and, and then it has a picture, a sketch of the line of the tribe of Judah. Um, something to remind them, that's, that's doing something practical, and they may have put it up there as a good luck charm, which is, you know, there's no such thing as luck, but, uh, but it, is, it can be seen as a reminder of what you're supposed to have on your heart, to love the Lord. That Deuteronomy passage is, is a dark saying of old that you get from the Bible. I could share with you a maybe a more disturbing one. Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 29. Our God is a consuming fire. Or maybe, maybe Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart, your heart, my heart, the heart is more deceitful than all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? The Lord understands it. Verse 10. Or I could share something from the Psalms, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or we could listen to David say, Your servant was tending the father's sheep, my father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came I, and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. When he rose up against me, I seized him by the beard and struck him and killed him. All part of these these things we receive from the Word. Or maybe the, maybe the darkest saying in the Bible, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or maybe the bright, one of the brightest sayings in the Bible, He is not here. He is risen. Just as He said three days later. Or maybe something that you can't find out about any other way about the future. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 
at the last trumpet, the dead shall rise and be raised imperishable and we will be changed. All those things and the rest of this material, now leaving out the notes and the indexes and the maps, but you know, the bio, the 66 books, this is all straight from God. Parables, dark sayings of hope. It's wisdom from above. You cannot get it anywhere else. Nobody could make this up. This isn't like any other book or set of books in the Bible written by one author, the Holy Spirit. Listen to it. I open my mouth and declare it. Greg opens his mouth and declares it. Your parents will tell you about it. Listen. But it has to come from here. The Bible. Parables. Dark sayings of old. 2,000 years ago, when you read Matthew, or the revelation of Jesus Christ by John. 2,400 years ago, if you're reading Malachi. 2,700 years ago, if you're reading Isaiah. And if you read Psalms of David or Proverbs of Solomon, that was 3,000 years ago. And when you read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, written by Moses, don't let any college professor tell you anything different, written by Moses, he was writing... 3,400 years ago. And when you read him, you read about things. You read about the first 168 hours of the dawning of time 6,000 years ago. And all of it is true. And all of it is dependable. Listen. We tell them to you. Other people have told them to you. Whether it's a grandparent, a parent, a Bible-believing teacher, obey Psalm 78 and listen and hear. Apply your, incline your ear, use your ear to receive the information. It's the same viewpoint that Peter had when he said to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Listen, my people, Psalm 78, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, which our forefathers, our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from, the next, from their children, but tell to the next generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works He has done. For He has established a testimony in Jacob and pointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children. So listen. Listen well. Listen well, for you must take our place. You must replace us. Young people joining the church now, those of you who are gathered here, anybody who's here younger than I am. Now, I'm not the oldest here, I got that, <laughs> but I'm getting up there. Um, you must listen to the Word of God, the Bible, the sword of the Spirit, all the days of your life. But you must not just stop at listening. You must tell. Psalm 78 makes that really clear. You must teach. Everybody must teach, must pass it on. It's non-negotiable. It's required. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. It is your job to teach the whole Bible. Get a Bible and, and, and look at the table of contents. The Old Testament, we'll just say the Old Testament the name of the Old Testament books. You need to know what's in all of these books. You, know, you need to know the end of Nahum. You need to know um, the stories of Daniel. The, 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 some of the 
scriptures that the wise men studied to know that there was going to be a king coming to Jerusalem. So, y'all may know the um, James Ward's way of singing these, these, oh, oh, well. These are the holy books. Tell me their names and I'll take a second look. This is his holy word. We'll share the message till all have heard. Now look at the list. Genesis, Exodus, mm, mm. How about that? Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, mm, mm. I tell you the truth about the book of Ruth. Go to first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, all those things lead to Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Job. I want to go to heaven in a righteous robe singing psalms. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and the Prophets are these. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Jay's Lament. Our children learned by singing this song that Jeremiah wrote, Lamentation. Jay's Lament, Ezekiel, Daniel, to the lions went. Hosea, Joel, and Amos's tale, Obadiah, Jonah, in the belly of a whale. Micah, Nahum, and Habakkuk's cry, Zephaniah, Haggai, and then Zechariah. Malachi winds up the end of this spiel, and God's going to show you a brand new deal. You know, that's, that's your, your outline of the first part, the promises part of the Bible. And then you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Roman. You've got the rest. It's your textbook. It has the promise of the Spirit. The Spirit is not promising to, to work into your heart Shakespeare's plays. Find a read Shakespeare's plays. Sort of a dirty old man, but you find a read those. But this is different from everything in the world. It is your job not just to listen, but to teach the whole Bible. Psalm 78, 6 and 7a they, that they should teach them to their children that the generation to come might know, even children yet to be born, that they, children not yet born, may arise and tell them, got the same Psalm 78 to obey when they, when they grow up, tell them to their children that they should put their confidence in God. Gordon and... and Marjorie are gone. Miss Marie's gone. Tom and Catherine are gone. Roy and Margaret. By the, by the way, I hadn't really thought about this till this week. I mean, I, I've often said, you know, my uncle was a founding ruling elder here. But when I think about the continuing church movement, when I think about Ruth Anna's dad, Charles, Charles Wilson, who is just about eight years older than me who fought on the front lines for a continuing church. We weren't trying to make a new church. We were just trying to do the same things, believe the same Westminster Confession of Faith that had been around since the 1600s. That's all we wanted to do, to preach, teach the the gospel, share the gospel, and and train people up in Christian discipleship. Um, But I, I realized that since this is the continuation of old Beersheba, that this is Mama's church too, because that's where she grew up. I ain't quite put that together till this week, thinking through this. But they're gone. Charles and Ruby, Donald, William, Henry, Joanna. A lot of people are gone. The Lord always provides replacements. So that's what that's. I think that's why Tom read this frequently out loud. He knew, he knew the founders were going to be gone. But it's the next generation and the next generation, and it's your job to obey Psalm 78. So tell, tell what you know. Tell the old, old story. If you know 10 Bible stories, if you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, paid for your sins so that you could go to heaven instead of going to hell, In South Carolina these days, you are an expert in the Bible. That's why RTBE is so important. 
That's why Billy Graham Library. It's not a library. It's the gospel. What, 17 or 19 times when you go through there? This is why the Gideons, work of the Gideons is so important. People don't know anything. They don't even know they're disobeying the Ten Commandments. They have no idea what the Ten Commandments are. They don't know they're sinners. They don't know they need a Savior. If you know just a little bit about the Bible, everybody here within our culture is a specialist in Bible knowledge. That doesn't mean you need to stop where you are, but it just means you've got lots to share. Anything you know makes a huge difference. So tell what you know. Tell. Find out what's in the Bible. You'll never run out of surprises. Memorize parts of the Bible. Think about the truths of the Bible. Discuss them with one another. Sing the Bible. Sing the Psalms. Sing, sing hymns based on the Bible, especially real hymns. So verses 1 through 5, listen. Verses 5 through 7a, tell. Listen, tell it, but live it. You must listen to the Word of God, the Bible, the sword of the Spirit, all the days of your life. But it must not stop there. You must tell, you must teach the Bible to the next generation so that people will be set in place so that when the new babies are born, those people will be ready right then to start telling and teaching them the Bible so that they will take it to the next generation. That's what Psalm 78 is saying that the generation to come might know even children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. But that's not enough. Hear, tell. Telling what you've heard is not enough. These truths must be lived. Verse 8, And not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. So the point is to tell so that you live, you obey out of your heart. You see, you've got to do a better job than we did. You've got to do a better job than the founders did. You don't just copy us because you'll have very mixed results. Obey the Bible. Keep the Bible. Do you remember the wise and foolish man? What exactly was the difference between the wise man and the foolish man? This is from Matthew 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these, who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains fell, floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. Everyone who hears, these are people sitting in church, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, that's the difference, will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, floods came, winds blew, slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Hear and act. In Psalm 78, it's listen and tell and all the while keeping and obeying the word in your heart. As you get ready to do this, Romans 6.23 is a simple way to pass it on, to thank and praise him for what he's done for you. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen to the gospel of grace. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, according to the Bible alone, and therefore to the glory of God alone. In other words, carry on the tradition. The path that's already been laid out for you by those who established Temple Presbyterian Church. Almost 50, 50 years ago, the Congregation of Beersheba Presbyterian Church, which included the first people who started Temple, voted to leave a denomination that no longer believed the Bible is the Word of God. Mr. Gordon Pretty, 
Pastor James G. Pretty was the pastor, and he wrote this. Dear Bill, in view of the stance of the Presbyterian Church in the United States regarding basic Christian principles, the Bible, its inspiration and infallibility, 2 Timothy 3.16, Titus 1, 2, etc., concerning Jesus Christ, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, the only way of salvation, Acts 4.12, etc., concerning the condemnation of the unbeliever, John 3.18, etc., and the necessity for individual repentance, Mark 1, 5, Acts 2, 38, Acts 3, 19, etc., it has, through the years and months, become increasingly evident that if I, Mr. Pretty, if I am to be loyal to Jesus Christ, my Savior, Lord, and King, if I am to be His faithful witness, then I must leave the PCUS, parenthesis, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. And he didn't write this in there, but I'll tell you what it says. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is, what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And then to continue, he said, That time has arrived when I feel that God has said to me, This far and no farther. I take these words from a court document which the elders, Donald Brown, Tom Clark, William Dixon, Roy Neal, and James Thomas, and deacons, Eddie Persley, McDowell Smith, and Bryce Stevenson, and trustees, Ruby Hudson, McDowell Smith, and Bryce Stevenson. No, Ruby Hudson, Alice McAfee, and McDowell Smith were named as defendants in the lawsuit for taking the stand that Mr. Pretty wrote to the clerk, uh, uh, stated clerk of Presbytery. The congregation voted 50 years ago, July 1, 1973, to leave the Presbyterian Church in the United States and Bethel Presbytery, noting that, quote, such freedom is guaranteed by the first and 14th amendments of the Constitution of the United States of America. The vote recorded in the court records was 54 in favor, joining a new nomination, six against and seven abstentions. In their concluding statement, they said, we take this action with regret after much heart searching and prayer, believing very sincerely that we owe our primary allegiance to God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, rather than to any church establishment. In spite of a more than 80% positive vote, including the abstentions, a Presbyterian Commission declared the vote null and void, and that was the same outcome in the Court of Common Pleas. Therefore, we get to worship here in this place. And you can find a couple like Greg and Ruthanna. And a pastor like Greg who not only has the privilege and encouragement from his Presbyterian denomination to preach the Bible as the infallible Word of God, but is so eager to do exactly that. And we, and you, all of us, we can take the same stand on those same and determinative issues. The Bible is God's holy, inspired, infallible, inerrant Word. Listen to all of the Bible. Tell all of the Bible whatsoever He has commanded us, to everyone, to as many coming generations as possible, and live in obedience to all that the Bible teaches. Don't be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Build your house on the Lord. On the 1st of July in 73, 
the congregation voted to be set free. Struggles and sufferings arose from their stand, but gospel light now shines from this rise on the land. To God be the glory, great things he has done. He established at temple the worship of his son. May the Bible, the Reformed faith, and the good news of grace ever be lived and proclaimed in this holy place. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for those who've gone before. We thank you most importantly for the scripture itself, for the Spirit, applying it, inspiring it, and promising to illumine it as we pick it up and study it, read it, hear it, anytime we have contact with it. Father, I pray that you would give great peace and joy as the people here share the word, as they have vacation Bible school and other outreaches, uh, as they grow, uh, as they become a brighter and brighter light here set on this hill. Thank you for your many blessings. Help us to listen. Help us to speak. Help us to live as you would have us to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A world that uh, desires to hear something new every day or to create something new every day. We have just wonderfully been reminded of uh, the constancy, the stability, the need for that great old, old story, the scripture and the gospel message. Let's respond to the wonderful message from God's Word by standing and singing number 621, Tell Me the Old, Old Story.
We are thankful for the years that the Lord has given uh, to Temple Presbyterian Church. Thankful for the many individuals and family members that the Lord has given to Temple Presbyterian Church. And it is for His glory that He's done so. It's for His kingdom. It's for His bride, the church. It is for our benefit. It is for the benefit of the world that many others will hear that same old story, the simplicity of it, the complexity of it, uh, the good news and the bad news. Uh, We have heard it. Uh, We are now to tell it. Uh, but we also must go and live it, that others might see Jesus Christ in our hearts and through our lives. And so we are grateful this morning to be called by Jesus Christ. And so those who are in Christ Jesus receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. you to stay and make your way across to the fellowship hall where we will enjoy a wonderful lunch together, uh, remembering again to extend uh, welcome to our newest members and thanks to Wallace and Ruth for being here this morning. Go in peace.